everyone, I'm Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Arts in the City. We are coming to you today from the New York Historical Society. Art is all around us, very much alive and well, and in our opinion, we could all use a dose of it right now. So on today's show, we've got a magnificent new statue in Central Park, and get this, it's the only one based on real women there. Also, a tour of hidden gems in our city subways, a court sketch artist, and Neil Rosen speaks with the stars of the new movie, Then Came You. But first, let me tell you a bit about what's going on right here. Strength amid tragedy. These images capture both our city's heartbreak and resilience. They're part of a special outdoor exhibition at the New York Historical Society called Hope Wanted, New York City Under Quarantine. Margie Hofer is the museum director. There are some incredibly um, sad and poignant images, a uh, number of photographs that show completely deserted streets and buildings, Grand Central Station, LaGuardia Airport, uh, Times Square, just deserted. The city that never sleeps, you know, completely dead. But at the same time, there are images of smiling people and very upbeat messages on theater marquees. The exhibition was curated by writer Kevin Powell and photographer Kay Hickman. They traveled the five boroughs in early April, documenting the city's grueling experience through pictures and interviews. I kept watching the news day after day and watching the nurses literally cry out for help in New York City. So I put in my resignation and came here to New York to help my fellow nurses and all the patients that we can that are sick with this virus. I couldn't not come. I spent a lot of time wondering where I picked up the coronavirus, probably too much time. First I thought maybe I got it when I went to New Orleans for work. It was also around the time when Corona was starting to become a household name, when we were first talking about it. So I remember getting down there the first day and then hearing like everything was Corona, Corona, Corona. And I started getting worried. The exhibition is free to the public with timed entry tickets and audio of the interviews is available by cell phone. Wandering through is a reminder of how far we've come and in many ways, where we remain. We're inviting visitors to look back and to reflect on um, what happened then and what continues to unfold now. Hope Wanted is on display through November 29th. Also, the New York Historical Society is now open for indoor visits as well. You can get the details on their website. Next, we take you to Central Park, where a stunning new bronze statue has gone up. And believe it or not, it is the first statue based on real women in the park's history. About time, don't you think? Donna Hanover explains. Three, two, one. Women have broken the bronze ceiling in New York Central Park. For the first time ever, the park has a statue based on real women. It's called Women's Rights Pioneers. It was unveiled on August 26, 2020, the 100th anniversary of the ratification and certification of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. The statue is a seven-year labor of love by a group calling themselves Monumental Women and their president, Pam Elam. It's rare these days when so many people are talking about tearing statues down that we put a statue up, getting that statue not only up, but on literary walk in the heart of Central Park, in the heart of New York City, indicates how many people, especially how many women and girls wanted it. The sculptor, Meredith Bergman, describes the three women in the statue. Sojourner Truth, the great orator, is speaking. Susan B. Anthony, who traveled far and wide and always focused on the vote, is organizing. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who is kind of the radical philosopher of the group, is writing. Would these women have been together in real life? They knew each other. They corresponded. Sojourner Truth was an overnight house guest of Stanton's. So I think they could easily have sat down either at a women's rights convention or in Stanton's home. The statue weighs 7,000 pounds, and Bergman, whose studio is in Connecticut, had it transported all in one piece for her team to install on the granite pedestal in the park. Even though COVID rules kept the crowd small, the unveiling was a big day. As Sojourner Susan 
Elizabeth understood, we are all freer when every one of us is free. Bergman is a world-renowned sculptor, and her previous work includes a grouping in Boston that salutes Abigail Adams, activist Lucy Stone, and poet Phyllis Wheatley. For the Central Park bronze, Bergman first created a model about a foot high for design approval, and then she made one about a third the final height. Then a full-size enlargement was made with a foam base covered in clay, and Bergman refined some elements. Next, molds were made of the various sections, and hot wax was painted inside the molds, creating a wax version for the sculptor and her team to do more work. It's in pieces, it's in sections, there'll be a hand and a head and part of the body. And I go in and put in all the details of eyebrows or some of the details in the dresses. And then that wax is put into a fireproof mold and melted away. That's why it's called the lost wax process. So all that work is just gone, but you have the mold into which molten bronze is poured. And when that's cooled, the mold is cracked away and it's how bronze has been cast for thousands of years. You end up with hollow sections that are then welded together. A chemical patina is put on. Acids, pigments, chemicals that bond with the metal and create that beautiful golden brown color. Is it honestly true that there is no other statue of real women in Central Park? There are allegorical figures. There's like, Alice in Wonderland, Mother Goose, Juliet with Romeo. No real women. Great actresses give voice to the women's rights pioneers on an app called Talking Statues. I was born a slave in Ulster County, New York. They called me Isabella Baumfrey. But after I left that house of bondage, I gave myself a new name, Sojourner Truth. I am Susan B. Anthony. I was born into a Quaker, anti-slavery family, and as a young woman became a teacher. I was born Elizabeth Cady in Johnstown, New York. There's also a workshop called Put Her on a Pedestal, where youngsters can choose their own honorees and design their own statues. The monumental women say they have more work to do, including challenging other cities to erect new tributes. It's on us to move history forward. I'm Donna Hanover for Arts in the City. Our city is full of hidden historical and artistic gems, none more intriguing than those underground. Susan John takes us there. Above ground, it's bright lights, big city. But beneath the streets of New York, it's a whole other world. New York underground is a treasure trove of new things to discover. Actually, old things that go unnoticed every day by millions of New York City subway riders rushing by pieces of the past preserved in plain sight. This is the original wall from 1904. Original wall. And commuters pass, pass by, by every day and have no clue. No clue. Justin Rivers, Chief Experience Officer of Untapped New York, took me on the Secrets from Below tour before COVID to explore historical gems of the world's largest subway system. New York City's rapid transit first opened in 1904 with just 28 stations owned by two private companies. Today, there are over 400 stations publicly owned by the MTA. New York grew at such a rapid clip in the 20th century that they just had to build on top of history, basically, and a lot of it's still there for us to enjoy. Like the genuine tile art at Chambers Street Station. This right here is a remnant of the original mosaic artwork from 1917 when they opened the station. Um, sort of hidden, tucked away back here at the end of the platform, this is a representation of the Brooklyn Bridge from when this was going to be called Brooklyn Bridge Station. The name was scrapped, but not the original art, still there for all to see. Along with an opulent and often overlooked entrance to the Jay-Z. The ceilings that are above our heads are designed by Rafael Guastavino. Um, they're vaulted, self-supporting arches, interlocking terracotta tile. We get another glimpse of the famous architect's work as we pass the abandoned but perfectly preserved Old City Hall Station. Closed to the public but visible from the downtown 6th train as it loops back uptown. 
Designed by Heinz and Lafarge, the original crown jewel of New York City's subway system boasts elegant Guastavino tiled arches, grand chandeliers, and shimmering skylights. Too small to fit new, longer trains, the station closed in 1945. But other stations, like Spring Street, were extended, creating a virtual time machine on the walls. You can literally see the dividing line in the wall, where 1960 avocado green, your grandma's fridge, 1904 cathedral-like Beaux-Arts architecture. Uptown, a stop at Union Square reveals relics in red frames, an art installation by Mary Miss that's easy to miss. She puts a message in each one of the frames that tells you what you're supposed to be looking at. And if you think it's only tourists looking, think again. Rivers says the majority of his tour goers are traveling through time on their own lines. We are helping New Yorkers rediscover their city. Secrets from Below is only running private bookings now in light of COVID. Check out all Untapped New York has to offer at untappedcities.com. For Arts in the City, I'm Susan Jun. When you think of a trial, you probably don't think art, but sketch artists have been depicting court proceedings since the 19th century. Mariev Ami spoke with a court artist who's had a front row seat at some of our city's most famous trials. I was a closet portrait artist. When I went to college, what was big was abstract art. And portraiture was passe. And I was a starving artist. And I didn't know how I was going to earn a living. As luck would have it, Jane met a court artist and felt this was something she could do. So she grabbed a sketchbook and drawing pastels and went to as many trials as she could to hone her skills. I became driven. I took a look in the mirror and said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to go after it. So I started with the startup company. At that time, 1980, CNN was the startup company. And they told me they had an artist there. And I thought, oh no, now I have to go with the big three. I think I called NBC first. And they said, OK, come in, let's see what you've got. So I went to 30 Rock and they took me into the newsroom and they, they shot my work and they put it on TV. I came home, I was very excited. I called my parents and said, Mom, on TV, look. And that's how it all started. 40 years later, Jane can tell us a few things about the challenges of the job, like how to get to court on time when you're told last minute, or waiting long hours for the trial to actually start. I could tell you stories about the El Chapo trial where People were camping out on the sidewalk to get a seat in there, starting at 4, 2 in the morning. And it was freezing out. It was winter. I had a bad seat in the Cosby trial. When the trial began, it was seven rows back. There was this giant screen in the, like a smart board, they called it, blocking half the court. So we could only see this side and that side. The Steve Bannon trial was particularly challenging. I got kicked out of the courtroom right after it, it was finished. And I had to go in the hall and finish up my drawing, get it on. Now I just have to go faster and faster. I'll be almost finished with a nice wide shot with lots of people in, and then suddenly somebody will jump up and something will happen. I have to start a whole new drawing. It's, it's rough. I have to remain neutral. I'm not putting in my opinion or my feeling. I have to draw out what's going on. That's my job, it's journalism. During the trial of the Boston Marathon bomber, the FBI reached out to Jane. They said, we have a secret mission for you, and we're going to take the three courtroom artists, that's all there were, three credentialed courtroom artists, and two reporters, and they're going to take us all to see the boat that Sarnev was found with the bullet holes in it. So nobody knew from the trial. All the, the reporters were back at the courthouse, and we were all in this giant warehouse looking at a bullet-riddled boat with blood stains on it. And it was very exciting to be part of that secret undercover mission. On social media, Jane's sketches oftentimes go viral, bringing mostly praise from the public. But sometimes she faces criticism, like with her sketch of Tom Brady. I'm very self-critical. I'm trying to do the best I can under the conditions I've got, which are really difficult. I love drawing people. I'm very lucky I can make a living at it. I still find it a challenge. I suppose if I felt like I mastered it, it might be boring. For Arts in the City, I'm Mari Avami. 
Skaters from the Ice Theater of New York haven't let the pandemic slow them down. When indoor rinks closed, they traded ice for concrete using parks, playgrounds and basketball courts to keep gliding and training. We loved watching them and think you will too. Jazz artist Alan Harris has lived a life as magical as his music, including being a composer and a cowboy. The acclaimed performer even spent his childhood mingling with celebrities at his family's restaurant. Barry Mitchell introduces us to this modern day Harlem Renaissance man. We had a quarrel and it tore my little heart in two. So I'm telling you, sweet darling, can't live my life without you. How is it? It's great. Composer, jazz guitarist Alan Harris lifts our spirits with swinging concerts live streamed from his brownstone in Sugar Hill. Harlem After Dark, it's, I'm trying to recreate the atmosphere that was during the Renaissance and post-Renaissance era in Harlem. I'm still streaming now, as a matter of fact, every Tuesday and Saturday. The music varies. We're staying, the template, of course, is jazz. We do a little bit of R&B soul. I throw in a little bit of country. It has to groove, it has to move. After all, it is Harlem, and people from around the world expect a Harlem night like myself to express themselves in a very eclectic manner, which is the Sugar Hill, which is where I'm on now. Unforgettable. Who was Nat King Cole? Nat was one of the first male vocalists who performed for white audiences without having to skin and grin, tap, dance, have a comedian beside him. He became beloved around the world. I am a purveyor of what he did. Unforgettable was a song that moved me, and I'm sure it moved millions of people around the world. It's incredible. That someone so unforgettable thinks that I am unforgettable too. Today I'll be taking you on a musical journey as we go back in time and explore America's West during the 19th century and the lives and struggles of black cowboys. Must have been a great thrill for you to have the Kennedy Center do a production of your play and use it as an interactive teaching tool. It was an honor beyond belief. From across those big blue waters, they've traveled hard and long. Some were seeking new beginnings. Some were torn from family's arms. What Cross the River is about, it's a story of the American West told through the eyes of a runaway slave. Uh, circa 1859, I called him Blue. And it shows his escapades, being what it is as a black cowboy. How I got the idea, my grandfather had a 600 acre ranch outside of Pittsburgh. And there we rode horses and men of color handled livestock there. It was a wonderful time. I used to come back to New York and be um, admonished by my classmates and teachers when I tell them that, yeah, I was riding horses with black cowboys on my grandfather's ranch, and they would say, there's no black cowboys, stop it. In fact, one in four cowhands of the Old West were people of color. I once spent a day at the Federation of Black Cowboys stable in Howard Beach. Mm -hmm. uh, and they told me the word cowboy had very negative connotations. The term cowboy was a negative connotation at first, go get that cowboy if you would, but then uh, the name caught on and everybody wanted to be a cowboy and you had to be good at roping, riding and shooting. It was a derogatory term during the time of the pioneering of the West. It was only until the advent of movies and the romancing of the West, cowboy became in vogue at the end of the 19th century. If you want to be a cowboy, just come along with me. One of my upcoming projects is about my uh, family's restaurant that they had called Kate's Soul Food, which was down the street from the Apollo. I spent many Sundays there as a kid, and I used to see entertainers coming in and order the food from Duke Ellington to Sarah Vaughn to Temptations. And so I, I wrote a 10 song cycle, which I composed called Kate's Soul Food, which will be out in January. 
Alan's music is available at iTunes, Spotify, and Amazon. For live stream concert information and more, visit alanharris.com. Thank you, man. This is one of I'm glad that you graced me with this. Thank you. Barry Mitchell, Arts in the City. Longtime TV fixtures Kathy Lee Gifford and Craig Ferguson have teamed up for a new movie now streaming. It's called Then Came You. Our Neil Rosen spoke with them about the film, being former talk show hosts, and New York City. Is this your first time in Scotland? My first time anywhere, really. Then Came You is the name of a new romantic comedy starring Kathy Lee Gifford and Craig Ferguson. Gifford, who also wrote the film, plays a widow who sets out to travel the world with her husband's ashes. Can I have one of your chocolates here? That's not a box of chocolates. I'm sorry. That's my husband. But when she meets Ferguson on the first stop on her tour, her life may be changed forever. What you have to do is to learn how to be happy again. What made you say to yourself, uh, I'm, I, I, I'm able to write a movie, I can write a movie, and where did this particular idea come from? I, I had no idea if I could write a movie. Um, it was, it's all Craig's fault. If you don't like this movie, blame him. Because we had hosted the Today Show together for a week a couple of years ago, and it was the most explosive week of television I had ever done in my life. I can't picture you in a kilt. Oh, no, I, 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 I guess you can. Yeah. Yes, you can. If I use yes, my imagination. You can. It was so much fun and so unpredictable, so entertaining, that we went to lunch afterwards and said, you know, what can we do next that was fun to harness what we have? together obviously it's, it's it's chemical what we have here and uh and craig was very funny he said you know if we wait for our agents uh to get us a job on television we'll die waiting so why don't we write a movie together he goes the reason why i think the movie works is because what kathy did in in that first little bit of writing was she harnessed the nature of our friendship you know the the and it was in a setting that made sense and it was in the type of movie that made sense. Both of you hosted talk shows, very successful talk shows for quite some time. Do you both miss your talk shows? I don't miss it at all. I had never dreamed of being a talk show host. When I was growing up, there were no talk show hosts. I, was, I wanted to be a Net Funicello or Haley Mills. I wanted to do Disney movies and sing and dance. And, uh, and then, you know, that was the world I longed for. And I sort of fell into television. Kathy and I started out kind of the same way. I also wanted to be Annette for the cello or Haley Mills. And, <laughs> but I was, you know, I was an actor in movies and in television, and I ended up doing the, the late night show. I had braised kangaroo when I was in the outback. <laughs> not, the, not the steakhouse, no, the actual the outback. <laughs> and I did it for a while, and I'm very grateful for doing it. I, I loved doing that show. I really did but I really don't want to do it again. It's done. Kathy Lee, I know you've spent a lot of time in New York when you did your show, and Craig, I know you've spent time in New York over the years. What are your thoughts on New York City prior to the pandemic? Just your thoughts on New York in general, and what are your thoughts on New York now? Some people are saying that it won't come back or it won't come back really in any way, shape or form that it was. I spent a lot of time in New York City. I feel very attached to New York City. When I first went to New York, it was on the tail end of, of the, the almost bankruptcy, if you remember that, the, the, the catastrophic 1970s administration. People said New York wouldn't come back after that. People have been saying New York won't come back for a long time. New York will come back. I was loved living there. I met my husband there. I've raised my children there. Uh, and I made great friendships with Regis and Hoda. None of that could have happened anywhere in the world for me except for New York. I'm grateful for it. There are wonderful, loving, kind, good, artistic people there. Do you think it will return to, the, to what we knew? I, I hope so very much. I love New York. New York's been great to me. Um, and, and I hope it does return to, it, to its... Uh, to its fantastic self. With Kathy Lee Gifford and Craig Ferguson, for Arts in the City, I'm Neil Rosen. As we close our relaunch of Arts in the City, I want to circle back to art all around us through some young and very talented eyes. Actually, through the lens of our own in-house photographer here at CUNY TV, Laura Fuchs. This is the first of an ongoing segment that we're calling Laura's Lens. And we begin with her recent series, Mask Smile, which gained international attention. Before we take you there, a quick reminder to check us out on social media. We would love to hear from you. Thanks so much for being with us today and enjoy.
When COVID first hit the city, I walked around with my camera documenting New Yorkers smiling from behind their masks. I noticed that people were walking around with their heads down, not making eye contact. And once I discovered that you can see a smile from behind the mask, the idea for the series was born. I would walk around for an hour or two every day asking New Yorkers to smile for me from behind their mask. Not everyone agreed to have their picture taken. It's a time of fear, a time of uncertainty, and social distancing is so important. But to those New Yorkers who agreed to let me take their picture, I'm so grateful. I've been able to document nurses, Crossing guards, bus drivers, children, hundreds of New Yorkers smiling from behind their masks. A smile is all in the eyes. It's been such a rewarding series to work on, to document the strength, the resilience of New Yorkers during this difficult time. It's so important that we continue to stay positive and that we lift each other up with our smiles.